How have you found these messages from Ecclesiastes? How have you found the conclusions that this book comes to? In the first sermon, we saw that our lives will never matter as much as we want them to. We want to live lives that leave a mark. Yet as history goes on, we will be forgotten. We crave a life of meaning and satisfaction. Over the weeks, we've examined some of the places we turn for that life. We've looked at education, pleasure, hard work, human relationships, religion, atheism and money. We've seen that none of them can fill the hole that we find in our lives. The book of Ecclesiastes tells us that ultimately they are empty and meaningless. Can I ask you to be honest? Have you struggled with those conclusions? The Bible here is tearing down things we love and hold on to. Have you discovered the Holy Spirit hammering away at your pride and your desire to be something big? I have. This is not an easy book to read and to get to grips with. If you found the last few weeks difficult, I've got some good news and I've got some bad news for you. Let's start with the good news. The good news is that in chapter 7, Solomon changes tack. For the first six chapters, Solomon has been showing the emptiness of life without God. Now, he is urging us to live life with God. These chapters aren't full of the emptiness of our lives, but an encouragement to know and follow God. But what about the bad news? Well, it's not really bad news, it's just we don't like to hear it. As we come to this section, we can't just forget the negative stuff that we've seen. We need to take it on board. We need to think it through. We need to respond. So how are we to deal with what we've learned so far? How are we to respond to it? Let me give you three instructions that flow out of what is being said in Ecclesiastes 7. The first is this. Don't drown out the hard questions. At the beginning of chapter 7, Solomon gives us a pair of statements. A good name is better than precious ointment, and the day of death than the day of birth. In the first of these statements, Solomon tells us that a good name, a good reputation, is better than wealth and riches, than precious ointment. That's something we know to be true and can often be seen at the end of someone's life. Imagine these two funerals. One is the funeral of a rich person who no one likes. How many people come? Probably not many. The other is the funeral of someone who doesn't owe much, but has lived a life of kindness that has touched many. How many people come? The building will probably be packed. That brings us to the second of these statements. And this one is a good deal harder to take on board than the first. Here, we're told that the day of death is better than the day of birth. And just in case we didn't pick that up, he repeats something similar in the next verse. It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. In effect, we're being told here it is better to attend a funeral than a party. How do you feel about that statement? Is that where you find yourself? As you look at the week ahead, are you eagerly waiting for a good funeral? Of course you're not. Funerals are not at the top of our social agenda. They don't occupy the highest point on our wish list. Funerals are hard. Funerals are sad. Funerals are painful. Funerals are difficult. I don't think that the Bible is denying that here. Remember Jesus. One day he went to visit some friends whose brother had died. What did Jesus do? At the end, he did a miracle. He raised Lazarus from the dead. But before that, the Bible tells us, he wept. Funerals are sad times. But here we're told it's better to be at a funeral than to be at the house of feasting. Why? Let me give you two reasons. First, at a funeral, we are brought face to face with the reality of death and our own mortality. 
as Solomon tells us in the second part of verse 2. For death is the destiny of everyone. The living should take this to heart. We live in a culture that tries as hard as it can to sanitise death, to distance ourselves from the reality of death. We don't have open coffins at funeral services. Most people I ask don't want the curtain to close at the end of a service at the crematorium. It seems too final. Yet it's impossible to get away from the reality that someone has died. And one day, we too will die. In day-to-day -day life, we can forget that. We can do all kinds of things to drown out the reminder of death. We can drive out those thoughts by filling our minds and thoughts with things that are more trivial. Yet enter a funeral and you can't ignore it. But there's more here. A funeral is better than a party because we find there a rebuke we need. In verse 5 we're told, It is better for a man to hear the rebuke of the wise than to hear the song of fools. What are the songs of fools? I think from the context they are songs that tell us that everything is okay. They are songs that tell us we can find life in love, wealth and fame. They are songs that tell us there are no problems, or at least no problems that we can't fix. Yet a funeral gives a different message. It tells us of death. An enemy that takes us one by one. An enemy that we can delay but are powerless to defeat. It tells us that there is something wrong. An enemy invasion in God's perfect world. It nails home the message of emptiness. It forces us to ask the question, in the end, what have I really done with my life? It reminds us that there is a day of reckoning with God. The judge of all the world. As the coffin is carried down the aisle, my self-assertiveness, my willfulness, my sin, my pride are all rebuked as I am reminded of my mortality and my own appointment with death. Why does God allow suffering in this world? Maybe you've been asking that question recently as you've seen the effects of COVID-19 spreading throughout our nation and around the world. Maybe you've asked that question as you've looked on at events in the States surrounding the murder of George Floyd. The answer to the question is not a simple one. There are all kinds of reasons that the Bible gives, and I'm sure some that it doesn't tell us about too. One of them, though, is this. God allows suffering to get our attention and to remind us of our weakness. That's what we see in the house of mourning. It's a truth we need to see. So Solomon tells us that the day of death is better than the day of birth. I want to ask you a question. When you are faced with these hard statements, when you are faced with these hard questions, what do you do with them? Do you think about them or do you ignore them? It strikes me that in our day, it's so easy to drown out the voices of difficult truth. We have entertainment at the click of a button and rather than think, we can blast it out by binge watching a series on Netflix. Or we can throw ourselves into the world of social media. We can lose hours trawling timelines and random videos. We have no shortage of diversions and distractions. But God is urging us here to be different to that. He's urging us to welcome these hard truths, to see that they're important, to grasp that it is good for us to recognise and see these things. There is a benefit to our lives, a benefit of ultimate value to be brought face to face with our weakness, face to face with our mortality, face to face with the reality of death, face to face with the emptiness of life without God. And that's the first instruction I want to share with you as we deal with the hard truths of the book of Ecclesiastes. What have we been told? Life without God is meaningless. We will not fulfil our desire for significance. It's a painful statement. And let me be honest with you. I want to say, Phew, how do you know? How can you say that? Yet as we saw a few weeks ago, it's true. But now I have a choice. Do I push that out of my mind or do I think on it? 
Do I ignore it or do I act on it? How can I know God? The Bible tells us there is only one way. That's why coming and trusting in Jesus who dealt with sin at the cross. That if I trust in him, my sin is dealt with and God forgives me so that I can know him. As I face up to the insignificance of my life, do I let it drive me to Christ so that I may know the significance of being a worshipper and child of the King of Kings? So how should we respond to the difficult truths of this book? First, don't drown out the hard truths. Then second, don't turn your back on God. Verse 9 says, Be not quick in your spirit to become angry, for anger lodges in the heart of fools. When life doesn't go how we want it to, it's easy to get angry and frustrated. We might get angry with ourselves for letting the situation develop or not handling things better. We might get angry with others for their part. And what about God? In verse 14, we're reminded that God is as much in control of the day of adversity as the day of joy. In the day of prosperity, be joyful, and in the day of adversity, consider. God has made the one as well as the other. Why is it that life in this world doesn't satisfy? Why can we not find contentment here? One of the reasons that Ecclesiastes reminds us of again and again is that this world is a place of suffering. It's a place with sin. It's a place with wickedness and oppression. It's a place where life doesn't go how we want it to. It's a place of frustration and heartache. Just think back to chapter 3. There we read the words, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. Just think about those for a moment. There is joy, but also sadness. There are events we welcome, but also those we want to run away from. As we walk through life, we will walk through times of difficulty and hardship. Our lives won't be just ease and comfort. We will suffer and we will struggle. That's true for the Christian as much as the person who doesn't know God. I was reading this week about a missionary couple called Thomas and Wendy Smiley, who went out to serve Christ in the Middle East in the late 1980s. As a toddler, their oldest son, Chris, was diagnosed with an aggressive cancer. He pulled through after months of treatment. Then, as a 15-year-old, his health worsened. He had developed bone cancer caused by the radiation treatment he'd had so many years before. I was reminded that serving Christ does not mean we won't suffer. How do you feel about that? How do you feel about the statement of it here in this book? How do you feel about it when suffering hits? Do you find yourself feeling it's unfair? That seems to be the complaint in verse 10. Say not, why were the former days better than these? For it is not from wisdom that you ask this. Here, the sufferer cries out why, but it's more than a cry for a reason. It seems to be a statement of innocence. Why have things changed? Why is God dealing with me like this? I haven't done anything wrong. It's unfair. Do you find yourself getting angry with God? Look at verse 13. Consider the work of God. Who can make straight what he has made crooked. Is that where you go? God has done this. He's made my life crooked. It's not right. It's not fair. It's not loving. How dare he do this to me? When suffering hits, it's easy to get angry with God and want to turn away from him. But if we do turn our backs on God, what do we gain? Where does it actually get us? What have we seen throughout this book? The only place where we can find true life, where we can find joy, where we can find true contentment is in knowing and following God. He is the key to life. He is the answer to hope. 
If we turn our back on God, we turn our back on life. If we walk away from him, we walk away from the hope and joy only he can bring. As it were, we cut off the hand that feeds us. So what should we do? What are we left with? How should we respond to the honesty of suffering in this book? How should we respond to the presence of suffering in our lives? To answer that, can I take you to a garden outside Jerusalem a little under 2,000 years ago? I want us to wait and watch as we see Jesus approaching. It is the night that he was betrayed by Judas. It's the night before he goes to the cross. He knows what he will suffer as he dies on the cross. He is now anticipating the physical pain of the cross. Yet that's not all. He is burdened with the reality of the suffering he will endure as the Father, his Father, removes the smile of his blessing and replaces it with the frown of his wrath for sin. Jesus is about to die as a sacrifice for our sin. As we stand there, we overhear his words to the disciples. My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. Jesus is suffering. He has done nothing wrong. He has done nothing to deserve this. What does Jesus do? He gets on his knees and he prays. Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. I want you to notice two things. Firstly, Jesus is honest. He doesn't cover up the pain. He doesn't seek to hide the suffering from God as he prays. I think this is one place where we can go so wrong in our response to suffering. We think that God wants us to bury the suffering deep and not let it show. We feel that to show the pain of our hearts is to somehow deny our faith and be lacking in trust. But that's simply not true. Over and over in the Psalms, we find people of faith being urged to trust God by bringing their honest prayers to him. Jesus exposes his heart before the Father. If there is any other way, he cries. As we struggle with difficulties in life, when they don't make sense, when we feel hard done by, God knows our struggle, so don't try to hide it. Bring it to him. Yet I also want you to notice that Jesus speaks honestly from a position of trust and submission. He begins by stating that the Father is his Father, even though he's calling him to walk this hard path. He's not just the Father, he's the Father who is all-powerful. How does Jesus end? Not what I will, but what you will. Over the last few weeks, I've read a couple of articles explaining how Stoicism can help us get through the current corona situation. What is Stoicism? At its heart, it is a philosophy of life that focuses on the things we can control and avoids worrying about the things that are out of our hands. It is about avoiding an emotional response by emphasising the practical and the pragmatic. As Marcus Aurelius, the Roman emperor and philosopher, once said, things do not touch the soul. It is a philosophy with ancient roots, but it's still very much around today. Keep a stiff upper lip is a modern expression of stoicism. You see it in an approach to life that says, don't get worked up about things, just focus on doing the next right thing. Is that how the Bible urges us to respond to suffering in our lives? No. The Bible is real and honest about the emotional pain of suffering. It doesn't seek to suppress it. Yet it does urge us to direct that pain into prayer, honest, trusting and submissive prayer, to speak with God, to pour out our heart to God and at the end of it all to remember that he is God and his will be done. The key to joy in the hard times is not putting our emotions to one side and focusing on something we can control. The key is to bring our broken hearts to God and know and trust that he is in control. So do you find yourself struggling right now? 
Do you find yourself frustrated? Frustrated maybe with the emptiness that this book has exposed in your life. Frustrated with the difficulty of your circumstances. Frustrated with God. Don't turn your back on him. Don't let the fires of anger burn in your heart. Let that frustration drive you to God in honest and trusting prayer. So how should we respond to the truths of this book? Well, don't drown out the hard truths. These are truths we need to think through and take on board. Then don't turn your back on God. If we do, we turn our back on hope and joy. There's one more instruction I want to give as we take on board the hard truth of this book. Don't think you're different. It's tempting, isn't it? To look at the statements of this book and think, okay, I see where you're coming from, but it will be different for me. Solomon, you didn't find contentment in money. That's because you had too much or your personality was different from mine. Solomon, you didn't find true joy in parties. Well, that's because you never came to any of my parties. Solomon, you didn't find education the answer to life. Well, that's because you didn't go to Sahari's or whichever school you went to. Maybe you look at this book and say it was written 3,000 years ago. It's not the same today. Or what about this one? Solomon, you made a mess of your life. The Bible tells us you got it wrong. I'm not planning on doing that. I'm different. So often our response to these hard truths is to distance ourselves from them and think that we are somehow different, that it doesn't apply to us. But we're not. And Solomon reminds us of that here. What is he telling us in verses 15 to 29? No matter who we are, we won't find the ultimate life in living a good life. No matter how hard we try. Look at verse 15. In my vain life, I've seen everything. There is a righteous man who perishes in his righteousness. That's as true today as it was in Solomon's day. Being good, being the best of people doesn't guarantee long life. Over 400,000 people around the world have died from COVID-19 in the last few months. Some have been old and some have been young. If you look down the list and got to know the lives of each, you'd quickly see it hasn't just been the bad people who have died. That's why Solomon says, be not overly righteous and do not make yourself too wise. Why should you destroy yourself? In effect, he says, don't burn yourself out trying to be as good as you possibly can be. Why? It's not because being righteous is a bad thing. Every follower of God is called to live a righteous life. It's because it's not the answer to life. Why? because we can never live a life that's good enough for God, a life that does not deserve his judgment. Look at verse 20. Surely there is not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. You see his despair at this as he looks at others and the propensity of sin and the schemes of sin in people's lives. I found one upright man among a thousand, but not one upright woman among them all. Now, that's not a sexist statement, although at first glance it might seem that way. It's a statement from Solomon's own life. The Bible tells us he had 700 wives and 300 concubines or semi-wives. Just stop and think about that for a moment. I still remember the first time we read that passage with Matthew and Nathan. As soon as I read it, Nathan immediately piped up, why would he want to do that? If we look at the life of Solomon, these 1,000 women were very much his downfall. He was the king over God's kingdom. He had been given so much wisdom, power and wealth by God. Yet we're told his wives led him to worship other gods and he drifted away. There is no evidence either way, but I like to think of Ecclesiastes as a book that Solomon wrote at the end of his life. It certainly has that feel to it. If that's true, here he is reflecting on the course of his life. As he does so, he sees very few who have pointed him to the right paths. Goodness 
is no guarantee of happiness because we can't be good enough for God. Solomon couldn't find life there and we won't either. We are no different. The only place that we can find ultimate life, the life that truly counts, a life of meaning and satisfaction, of true joy and happiness, is in knowing and following God. To be the one, as verse 18 points out, who fears God. It's no different now, 3,000 years later, than it was in Solomon's day. Can I ask you a question? Where are you looking for life today? As we've gone through Ecclesiastes, have you found that it has touched a sore spot in your life? Have you found any statements that you've wanted to ignore, cry out, leave me alone? Maybe the Holy Spirit prodded your soul when we looked at money and saw that no amount of money would bring us happiness. Maybe you became uncomfortable when we looked at living life without God. You feel happy living life without reference to God and you don't want to be told it's empty. Maybe it was when we looked at religion and saw that religious actions without God are meaningless. In your heart, you feel it's enough to come to church, to pray a little, but you aren't interested in any more. And so you didn't like being told that was empty. You may be separated from Solomon by 3000 years. You may be a different personality and have a different life, but his conclusions are still true for you as they are for me. If we want a life of meaning and purpose, we will only find it in knowing and following God. If you don't know him, if you're not a Christian, if you haven't come and said sorry to God, if you haven't recognised that you're a sinner and received from him forgiveness, that forgiveness that was earned at the cross by Jesus, can I urge you to do that? There is no other place where you will find life. Only God gives true meaning and purpose. Only God can give us something sweet that lasts forever. And if you do know him, if you are a Christian, can I urge you to grasp how precious that relationship is? That knowing God is not one of the keys to happiness and joy. He is not merely one of the pieces in the puzzle that makes our lives ones that count. He alone is the answer to life. Let's seek him and live for him with the singular passion that comes when we realise that. And let's have hearts that are filled with thankfulness. A thankfulness that comes from understanding what we have in Jesus. Let's pray. Oh Father, help us to know that you alone are the answer to the life that matters. That is a painful statement for us because in acknowledging that, we have to face up to the fact that so much of what we live for is emptiness. So many of our days, we are wasted. Help us to learn from the painful times in our lives, that we wouldn't be those who drown out the difficult and hard truths you teach us through them. Help us to not turn away from you when life doesn't go the way we want it to. Lord, it hurts. But we ask that you would use that hurt to drive us closer to you, not away from you. Lord, help us to realise that we are no different from Solomon. We are no better than he was. What was true for him is still true for us. Life is only found in knowing you. And we can only know you through Jesus. Help us to cling to him. Amen.